الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب اليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون او يو هو بيليف فير الله از هي شود بي فير اند داي نوت اكسبت از مسلمز بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام uh, dear brothers and sisters today i want to talk to you about two things uh, in the first part of the khutbah i will talk to you about surah fatir Uh, there are lots of children here. I'm assuming that because of spring break, there will be a lot more of children here. So I thought uh, I will share with you some of uh, the wisdom that our faith has about Surah Fatiha. And after that, I will talk to you a little bit about the concept of Rahmah or mercy in, in Islam and how they are tied to the concepts of Sadaqa and forgiveness. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين اياك نعبد واياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين امين This is the first surah of the Quran and all of you are familiar with it uh, it has many names it's called surah Fatiha which means a chapter which is the opening or the beginning uh The word Fatiha means to open, and so the Quran opens with uh, with Surah Fatiha. Even though it was not the first of revelations, according to many companions and many commentators of the Quran, it is the first surah that was revealed in its entirety. There are some who believe that Surah Fatiha was revealed in Mecca. Others who believe that it was revealed in Medina. Some actually believe that it was revealed twice in Mecca as well as Medina. Nevertheless. Uh, there is more consensus on the fact that this is the first surah which was revealed in its entirety and it is obvious because it is also so brief the surah is referred to as umm al-kitab the mother of the book of umm al-quran as the mother of quran the word umm besides meaning mother can also be understood as core as something that is fundamental so when we say that surah fatiha is umm al-quran or umm al-kitab Another way to think of Surah Fatiha is it is the core or the essence of the Quran. It is the core or the essence of the Holy Book of Islam. Some commentators have referred to it as equivalent to one third of the Quran. Uh, I don't know what that means, but what most commentators will tell you is that all the essential principles of the faith are in Surah Fatiha. So if you understand Surah Fatiha, you will understand most of islam and the essence of the holy book of quran uh it is also referred to as the seven most often repeated verses in the quran it is also referred to as ash-shifa which means the cure it is also a dua it is also called salah one of the nicknames of surah fatiha is as-salah the prayer itself in a very important tradition which i will share with you today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself refers to the surah Fatiha as as-salah, as the prayer. Uh, according to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, when Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his miraj, in the conversations that are reported, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to, have said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Rasulullah, you spoke directly with Moses. and you made Isa alayhi salam perform miracles what about me what have you got for me and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says i'm going to give you what i have not given to anyone ever before and that is surah fatiha but what is also interesting is that there are many traditions themselves many ahadis in which The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has told his companions, "Come, I will teach you the most superior surah in the Quran, which is found nowhere else. It is not revealed in the angel, 
It is not revealed in the Torah. It was not revealed to David. It is revealed to me. It is Surah Fatiha. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I'm going to give you something that I have never given to you, it is, this message is authenticated to many, many other traditions uh, in which the Prophet ﷺ himself says that not only is this the most superior surah, but it is the most unique gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Prophet Muhammad and to the rest of humanity. That is Surah Fatiha. There is a very interesting tradition in which the Prophet ﷺ is sitting with uh, Angel Jibra'il and they hear a noise, the two of them. And the Prophet says, what is this noise? And uh, Jibreel alayhi salam says that on Monday and Thursday, the gates of heaven are open. But today the gates are open because of this good news that is being shared. It is about the two lives that have been given to you and you alone. And those two lives, one is Surah Fatiha and the other are the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. For, for those of you whose members of the family are unwell, one of the best things to do is when you are in trouble, especially if it is health related or otherwise, is to recite at least the last ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah, which are a special blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given to Prophet Muhammad as a gift. <laughs> surah Fatiha is unlike any other surah in the Quran. Without the surah, your prayer is incomplete. If you do not recite this, your prayer is incomplete. Among the fuqaha and the founding, the mujtahids who founded the various legal principles of Islam, in the fiqh of Salah, there are various opinions. Some say that everybody should recite Surah Fatiha in every ayah, in every rakat of your prayer, even when you are behind the imam. Others say that you should recite them in every rakat only when it is a silent prayer, like the Salah, Zohar, and Asr. And in the loud prayers, you should recite Surah Fatiha only in the ayahs in which there is silence, which is the third in Maghrib and third and fourth in other uh, prayers. My suggestion to you is to, in your heart, to recite it in every uh, rakat. In fact, all the time, if you can, because this is an important prayer. Surah Fatiha has special blessings. What the surah does is, every time you sincerely recite this, well, I should not say <coughs> sincerely, because the sources don't demand sincerity. You just say, every time you recite this surah, you are engaged, you are united with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a dialogue. It is very special. It, it literally captures you and God in an embrace. It is like being in, in an embrace with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. According to a hadith of Qudsi, I said this before, but I think I'll repeat it with a lot of youngsters around today, that there are two sacred sources of our deen, Rasul of deen, Nasadir, sources of the deen, which are the Quran and the Hadith. The Hadith act as chronicles of the Sunnah of Rasulullah But in the Hadith category, there is a special type of Hadith, which is called Hadith of Qudsi. And the way you recognize Hadith of Qudsi is because the Prophet himself says, Qala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, so if the hadith begins with the Prophet ﷺ saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this, then that is the hadith of Qudsi. The word Quds in Arabic means sacred. So it's very interesting that the word translates as sacred hadith. We think of all hadith as sacred, but even Muslim scholars have labeled the hadith of Qudsi as a sacred hadith. So it's a secret of the sacred hadith. So there's like sacred to the power exponentially sacred hadith. These are very special. Uh, there are many collections of those available. You should take your time and read it if you can. There are collections of 40 and collections of 110. Now this particular hadith Qudsi about Surah Fatiha was narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. He said, and he quotes Prophet sallallahu who said, Allah Azwajal, Allah Almighty is he who said, I have divided prayer between myself and my servant into two hearts. So when you read the first sentence, you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about Salah. 
but he's actually talking about Surah Fatiha, as you will understand in the rest of the hadith. He said, I have divided prayer between myself and my servant in two halves, and my servant shall have what he has asked for. When the servant says, one of the sifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, he never reneges or breaks his promise. When Allah Ta'ala makes a promise, he will always fulfill that promise. Even to think that he will not fulfill his promise is blasphemy. Even to consider the possibility that God will move away from his, 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 his kufr. So this is a promise that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is making in this hadith. He says that I have divided prayer between myself and my servant into two halves, and my servant shall have what he has asked for. When the servant says, Praise be to Allah, Lord of the world. Alhamdulillah, Allah says, My servant has praised me. And when he says the most gracious and the most merciful, Rahman, Rahim, Allah says, My servant has extolled me. So every time you are reciting, I would recommend that pause. Pause. Don't go to Alhamdulillah, don't go like that. Say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Ar-Rahman, Ibrahim. In your heart, imagine this tradition and try to imagine listening to God saying this after you recite every ayah. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, imagine God in heaven telling his angels that my servant has praised me. And then he says, when he says, the most gracious, the most merciful, Allah says, my servant has extolled me. And when he says, Master of the Day of Judgment, Maliki Yomidin, Allah says, My servant has glorified me. And when, when the servant says, My servant has submitted to my power. There are two different traditions. One place he says, My servant has glorified me. But when he says, Maliki Yomidin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, My servant has submitted to my power. It's a it's an incredible statement. It is like saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted your aslam. I have submitted aslam to, I have submitted to Allah. That's what you're saying when you say Maliki Yomidi. You're saying I have become a Muslim. I'm submitting to you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding by saying, he's acknowledging and testifying that my servant has submitted to my power. And when he says, you alone we worship, you alone we ask for help. Allah says, this is between me and my servant. And he's telling this to his angels. This is between me and my servant. And my servant shall have what he has asked for. Then he say to you alone we worship. And you alone we seek our help. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding to you at that time and saying that this is between me and my servant. And he will get whatever he is asking for. And when he says, guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom we have favored, not those who have gone astray, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says again, this is for my servant, and my servant shall have what he has asked for. It is unbelievable. When you read traditions like this, you begin to understand the meaning when you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, why he is so merciful and so compassionate. Today we live in this very peculiar times where our religion and our faith and our sacred books are associated in the eyes of others with violence, uh, with cruelty, with barbarism, with intolerance, etc. Part of it is because of the prejudice against the community. Part of it is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not yet allowed his mercy to enter the heart of those who are deprived from the shadow, from the umbrella of this deen. There are no kafirs or mushriks. Don't think of the world as composed of kafirs and mushriks, etc. There are only two kinds of people in the world, Muslims and potential Muslims. That's how you should think of everybody. We are fortunate. We are blessed to be Muslims. And one way to acknowledge this blessing and this rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by praying for those who have not yet received this blessing. 
and those who have not yet <coughs> had this opportunity. So think of others as potential Muslims. Everybody is a potential Muslim until he or she dies. And after that, they are in the hands of Allah. It is not for us to judge what happens to them. Our judgment is this, that if we are either practicing Muslims or we are potential Muslims. In fact, I think within the Ummah itself, we can see that some of us are practicing while others are potential. So when we look at the potential Muslims and look at their misunderstandings of the deen and compassion, a lot of it is from ignorance, a lot of it comes from prejudice, a lot of it comes from bias, and some comes from political necessity for their own political agenda. They need to demonize Islam, marginalize Muslims, because that is necessary for their political goals. But I also feel that part of it is our responsibility. Stereotypes will disappear if they consistently and constantly clash with reality. If, suppose you spread the rumor that all people from South Asia are eight feet tall, and you keep meeting Daisies and Daisies every day from India, from Pakistan, and never meet anybody who's eight feet tall, eventually that prejudice or that perception is going to go away and say, look, the stereotype does not confirm to the reality. In my last 10 years, I have met 50,000 people from South Asia, and nobody was eight feet tall. So, so if there are stereotypes about Islam, and if people consistently see the reality of Islam as something that contradicts that reality, maybe not once, not twice, three times, four times, ten times, hundred times, every time when the reality of their encounter with Muslims and Islam contradicts the images and stereotypes that they have in their minds, that image and that picture will change. I submit to you that one of the reasons why, and I could be wrong, and I hope I'm wrong in that, that one of the reasons why the image of Islam that we project in our projections, which, are, which shows some cruelty, is because of the perception and image of Allah that we have in our heart. The image of God that we have in our heart manifests in the way we practice our deen. If the God that we imagine is an angry God, if the God that we imagine is a God who is punishing, who is taking revenge, then the faith that we practice when we have power reflects that understanding of God. There, is, there are 114 surahs in the Quran, except Surah Tawbah. Every surah begins with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always introduces himself as the most compassionate and most merciful. We know that one of his sifat is Al-Qaha. Al Mahsi, Al Hasid. But none of the surahs begin with that. Bismillah, Al Hasid, in the name of Allah who is Hasid. That is an important thing for us to understand. So in Surah Fatiha, even though there are only seven, only seven ayahs, the first one is Bismillah, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. And then Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, twice in just seven verses. The most frequently repeated verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala feels the need to emphasize rahmat. And that is the image of God that we want to nourish in our hearts. That God is most merciful, most benevolent. And that is the, the image of Allah and our deen that we want to manifest in our policies, in our society, in our culture. I want to end the first part with another important hadith. And I want you to listen to it. It is unbelievable to me. That is the definition. That's the way I understand our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this hadith, O son of Adam, however much you call upon me and place your hopes in me, I will forgive you without any reservation, without any condition. O son of Adam, if you have sins piling up to the clouds, if you have sins piling up to the clouds, and then ask for my forgiveness, I will forgive you without any reservation. 
O son of Adam, if you come to me with enough mistakes to fill the earth, if you come to me with enough sins to fill the earth, that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, O son of Adam, if you come to me with enough sins to fill the earth and meet me without associating anything as partners, without committing shirk, I will come to you with enough forgiveness to fill the earth. And that is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You seek forgiveness, you give. He is the most merciful, the most compassionate God. It will be a tragedy if we don't understand and internalize that. Alhamdulillah, uh, Dear brothers and sisters, there are some members of the community who have, uh, whose parents are not doing well, Brother Azhar and Sister Uzma's fathers are unwell. I would invite you all to do dua for them during a salah, and we pray to them for them now, that inshallah Allah Ta'ala will give them shifa. One of the attributes of Surah Fatiha is Shifa, it has the capacity to cure. One of the attributes of Rasulullah is also Shifa, that he is someone who will cure. So in this moment of stress, recite Surah Fatiha as much as you can and seek blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will do the same on your behalf. I want to tell you that we talk a lot about mercy and I'm sure you must be listening to me. I talk about it all the time, but what does mercy really mean? Mercy has three elements to it. Rahmah, Sadaqa, and Ghafara. Rahmah is mercy, Sadaqa is charity, and Ghafara is forgiveness. There are at least 79 verses that I counted in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself as Ghafur rahim as forgiving and merciful. <coughs> So oftentimes, whenever you look in the Quran and search for Rahim, you will find a Ghafoor going with it. These two attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala go together all the time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Tawbah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alam ya'alamuna allaha huwa yakhbalu at-tawbah an ibadihi wa yaqus as-sadaqat wa anna allaha wa at-tawab rahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do they not know that Allah is he who accepts repentance from his servants and receives charities? What this ayah means is that when we do tawbah, our tawbah goes to Allah, obviously. We can't do tawbah from anybody else because he is the one who forgives. But when we give charity or we give sadaqah, which is over and above what we give beyond zakat, anything over and above our zakat is sadaqah. Every time you do sadaqah, always do this niyyah. Oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just consider this as my zakat, and if it exceeds the zakat, then consider this as sadaqah. So that way you fulfill your obligation of zakat, and then if you're fortunate to give more, then it counts as sadaqah. This sadaqah, even though you may give it to an institution, to an organization, to an individual, to somebody who's suffering and poor, the recipient is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to both tawbah and sadaqa is the same, which is mercy and rahim. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to sadaqa with forgiveness, will respond to tawbah with forgiveness. And this is the meaning of rahmah. Rahmah, because we translate the word rahmah as mercy, it is oftentimes misleading. The word mercy is very tiny and small. The word rahmah is infinite in its meaning. When you smile at someone, that is compassion and mercy. When you help someone, that is mercy. Even when you give a gift to someone who is richer than you are, that is mercy. When you wish good of someone who is more powerful than you are, that is also mercy. Remember that. So that is rahmah. Rahmah is something khair. Anything that you do khair towards anybody else. Even if it is just wishing somebody assalamu alaikum, you see a stranger and wish peace and blessings upon them, that is rahmah. So rahmah is a much wider concept. And that is what we need to internalize in our culture, is to understand this concept of rahmah. I feel that if Muslims understand this notion of rahmah and understand its centrality to the deen, you will understand that when people ask you, can you give me a synonym for Islam, you will pick rahmah. 
When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this universe, He promised Himself that His mercy would prevail over His wrath. Uh, I think people should move a little bit forward. I think there are more people coming, so there is no cluttering. Number two, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Prophet ﷺ here, he described Rasulullah as mercy to all of humanity. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran, he described the Quran as mercy to the believer. Everything that you see, even this creation of Allah, is his mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's tajalli, his manifestation of this universe, of this creation, where Allah ta'ala discloses more and more about himself to us. That is rahmah. Allah ta'ala's creation of us and giving us life, and giving us the opportunity to find him and please him is mercy and rahmah. So if you look at the, the entirety of Islam from the beginning <coughs> to the end, it is rahmah. What do we pray for in this life? Maqfira, maqfira, maqfira. Maqfira is forgiveness. It is part of rahmah. We, we should understand it is, it is not about advocating for Islam. We, we are living in an age where people say Islam will prevail, Islam will this, Islam will that. It's not about Islam, it's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not create false deities which compete with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not talk about the greatness of anything else but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, greatness is my robe. And anybody who competes with that, I will throw him into hellfire. And that is an important part of it. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he forgives all of us. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us the opportunity to understand his true essence. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us the opportunity to recite the Ummul Kitab, the Ummul Quran, Surah Fatiha, as often as we can. I believe that when we... I pray that when we recite the Surah Fatiha, we are truly engaged in an embrace with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a divine embrace which will enlighten us, forgive all our sins. Rabbana atayna fi dunya hasnatan wa fi al-akhirati wa hasnatan wa qina azab al-maan bi rahmatika ya rahman rahimin as-salamu ala muslim inna allaha ya'amudu bil adli wa al-ahsan wa itarad al-qurba wa yanha al-fasha wa al-munka wa al-baqi ya'asakum la'anna kum tadakkulun wa akhidu salam